Give us 30 minutes each week to discover the trends that are shaping the future of retirement with That Annuity Show. We bring you conversations with industry leaders who are revolutionizing financial products, technology, and distribution channels. Now, here's your host, Paul Tyler. Hi, this is Paul Tyler, and welcome to another episode of That Annuity Show. Um, we've got two of our regular co-hosts. Tisa, how are you? I am good. Good morning. Listen, congratulations on your new role as head of marketing at Nassau Financial Group. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. Uh, certainly uh, some big shoes to fill, but I'm going to do my best uh, here to make you proud. Uh, I, I, think you'll, I think you'll be just fine, <laughs> fine. And I think you'll, you'll put your own uh, stamp on, on uh, you know, where the company goes. So congratulations, you know, from all of us. Um, Thank you. Bruno, uh, as always, good to hear from you from Canada. Good to be here as always as well, and um, yeah. especially today. Yeah, especially today. So, and we have a special, very special recurring, uh, I'm going to call her a recurring guest who almost needs no introduction. And um, our guest is Cheryl J. Moore, a, I, and I'm going to say a true powerhouse in the world of life insurance and annuities. She is Gotta be she must be like the most connected person in the field. Okay, bringing an enormous amount of expertise uh, to a space that desperately needs it at times. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, we've had a lot of change. I think to have somebody who actually can can put all the pieces together, and make sense of it, it's great. Um, and I've, I've got to say, she's probably one of the, the has has some of the one of the biggest following. You know, Cheryl, I think you've got over twenty five thousand people following you on LinkedIn. I so do. When, <laughs> when you say something, people listen. So thank you, and welcome to our show. Well, thanks. I appreciate being here again. It's always great to speak with all of you. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me let me start off with, with a question. We I think the last time you were on, we talked about your book. You actually have books. You know, tell us what tell what what's happening in the publishing world. Tell us how, how the, uh, the the progress you're making here. I see a lot of posts on LinkedIn with people with your books talking about what they're doing with them. Yeah, so I'm really excited because we've had some advisors who have really been creative in how they're using my book, uh, why I bought indexed annuities. And um, we've sold several thousand so far. We're getting 100 book orders right and left. So um, they're using them with prospects in order to educate them about these products so that consumers can maybe feel a little bit more secure about their purchase because there's somebody who's third party, unbiased, who has bought the products and is sharing their personal experience. So it's it's been really exciting to watch, Paul. Uh, if, excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, I know you just came out with a, a real interesting piece in, I think it was Think Advisor, unless you're correct, on uh, Monte Carlo analysis. Well, well, did I get the, I, I think I made the, mentioned the publication correctly. And, and Bruno, <laughs> Bruno's going to lead that conversation. But before we get there, maybe I, I would just be interested to get your your take on the uh, landscape of annuities. Now, I ca just came out of you know two conferences. One was the Lemmer National Conference that was uh, in Nashville. I guess I guess it was three or four weeks ago, and then uh, just at ITC and uh, where we camped out, and I think I, I probably interviewed fourteen people. You know, Tisa, mm -hmm. I wish you, Laura had been there with me. Um, yeah, I've done it before. Uh, that would have been fun. <laughs> yeah, and so you know, sure, a lot, a lot of things happening. You, you've written about a lot of the product. We're, we're seeing a lot of stuff in the technology side. You know, what's your, what's your perspective on uh, how much things are staying the same and how much things are changing in this business? Well, you know, um, the one thing that I've really been watching has been the interest rate environment. I mean, I anticipate that's going to affect our fixed annuity and you know, MIGA sales this year. Um, I have seen some innovation on the fixed annuity side in order to get over the interest rate ups and downs, but we haven't seen anything in a couple months, really. Where I'm truly seeing innovation is the indexed annuity market. Um, some of it I'm not a fan of, and other things are really, really great. You know, um, I remember when I started my business 20 years ago, we had 56 different ways of calculating indexed interest on indexed annuities. 
And we're getting close to that again, Paul, just yeah. because insurance companies don't want to be spreadsheeted, you know? So um, that's, that's a development that I wish would go away just because it complicates the story so much. I can't imagine some of these indexing methods being easy for insurance agents to understand and therefore consumers are going to be challenged to understand them as well. Well, and pricing costly. actuaries as well. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's good to know. Yeah, yeah, and, and and very very costly to implement. You know, if you if yeah. you've got something that just changes the math a little bit, all of a sudden now you're say, saying, well, could have put this up in three months. Now it's going to take nine because you got to go back to code base and make the changes. Mm -hmm. But we're also in a business. Somebody met, you know said, said this to me where, you know, the business model is based on differentiation. It's like it's not mm -hmm. our yeah. DNA. It's a state. It's the same. Um, it's interesting. That's especially true in the independent agent space, Paul. I mean, you really have to have new shiny bright objects to regularly show independent agents to get their attention. So they aren't selling for the guy across the street. Yeah. Do, no. do, do you have any suggestions there? Like I, if, if that's exactly what my comment was going to be, or my thought was, is the complexity is coming because the carrier is saying from a product design, like we need to differentiate. So we're going to do something different, but inherent and different, not always becomes more complex. So what are some of the other places to look to make that distinction? Do you see some opportunities that, you know, product design and carriers are missing? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of companies who have come out with this feature that I think is fantastic. And it's really the first time that we've seen it in the indexed annuity market, but they're using a best entry point method on their indexing. So if the market has a dramatic decline in the first, say, 60 days of the index segment, then the insurance company will lose that, use that new lower point in the measurement for your index interest. So, you know, I mean, I, I hate to bring it up, but if we have a crash similar to 08, 09, and you had just bought an annuity, then you get the opportunity to take advantage of that lower point and maybe cap out or get double digit gains where traditionally you would not have. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that I'd really love to see true innovation rather than just changing the calculation of the indexing methods. And that's just one example that I've seen over the past couple months that I think is going to become a big thing. Interesting. Well, I think anything that would raise the odds of that first statement coming in is positive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> would be a big deal for this industry. I, I've been on the other end of the conversation when, when it says you, you do get the zero and you get hit the charges, and it's not it's not pleasant to explain to somebody why they're mm -hmm. coming down, you know, mm -hmm. a percentage point or two percent. So, um, I guess I, I, on the uh, you know, what grows the market is, is kind of an interesting question. So I was at Limera and uh, um, uh, the CEO, uh, Mr. Levinson, put up, you know, he, he did a great, you know, deck. I don't know if Cheryl, if you, you saw this in terms of kind of laying out the drivers of the industry. And his his thesis was, and I think I heard this at another distribution panel, was that improving the user experience was key to getting growth. I mean, to what extent do you think it's right? What do you think it, it, it's 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 not as its product or value in these products? Well, you know, Paul, um, when I started working in life insurance 25 years ago, I will never forget my orientation day for the home office included a tour of the entire building and going through the process of an application from the point that it comes into the mail room until the contract is issued. And I remember distinctly them describing to me during the tour that soon we would have the ability to have electronic signatures and have something called straight through processing. <laughs> and here we are 25 years later and people are still struggling with it, you know? So um, technology really needs to catch up because there are other financial services instruments that are much more complex that you can have a consumer go out and shop for it on their own and purchase it without any intervention from someone. I'm not necessarily saying we should go to direct to consumer sales of annuities, but you know, people cannot compare one annuity to another to tell which they may like better. We can't get a contract issued very quickly unless you're one of those new startups that has really invested in technology from the front end 
and um, is working on product manufacturing as you know a day two issue. So there's a lot of opportunities for improvement when it comes to the user experience with annuities. So speaking of yeah. user experience, you you did mention in your book you have a very uh, a very unique uh, anecdote uh, about yourself looking for something that has value that is more secure and turning to a colleague and asking them like, where can you find those? And the answer was, well, right here in this building, <laughs> the building, your actual employer actually is the biggest producer of those. Um, I thought that was a very, a very, uh, a very good anecdote to, to, to put out there. Uh, in light of this, how is that consumer experience have improved or what, what is left to be improved in terms of, mm -hmm. uh, people actually knowing these things, these things is, exist? Yeah, that's a good question, Bruno. You know, um, I like to say that I've been working on rebranding annuities for 20 years, um, just trying to make it so that it's not the naughty stepchild of financial services and that people have access to factual information on these products so that they can make a decision on whether or not they're right for them. And I will say, you know, when I started the business, I was correcting the journalists who wrote the negative biased articles about annuities every day, like I do now. But then we would see an average of eight inaccurate articles about annuities published every day. And today I get less than one a day. Mm -hmm. um, I really think the SECURE Act has helped a lot with that, just because you have this huge chasm of financial services folks that look at annuities as illiquid, high commission, high fee products. And that's really based on old annuities. Today's annuities are very different. And the SECURE Act has made it so that you can have annuities within retirement plans like 401ks. And suddenly you're getting the attention of these people who have previously poo-pooed the product Um, and now they're saying, well, if you can have it in a 401k, maybe I should be looking at this for my clients. Yeah, um, I think I, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, I think, I think Cheryl, you, you I think you, you work you've done has really helped because I, I know how many journalists, you know, go to you for, uh, even on background, uh, for us. I think, I think we've done a better job, um, but you know, the ownership is still low. I think, you know, we've done a survey that we'll, we'll put out in a week or two, Um, where we went out and interviewed people about, it was, you know, kind of focused on longevity, the longer you live, how, how, how inconfident are you? And of course, you know, <laughs> the longer mm -hmm. you live, everybody's more worried. Um, I think what was really interesting in here was um, like only 9% of the people surveyed in this age range actually owned an annuity. Um, and wow. yeah, and the, there were some questions because, you know, we as a technology provider, were interested in user experience and like something close to half were dissatisfied with their online experience. So I think there's, mm. there's opportunity there. Mm -hmm. That that to me is the headline is, you know, how do we get more than 9% to own them? It may be that, you know, we need them to create a little better experience to get them to tell their friends that they should do this. So that this may be the next, uh, the next frontier, but why don't we shift gears? Uh, Bruno, do you want to set up uh, the discussion about uh, Cheryl's article on, uh, Well, I mean, it, yes, absolutely. It's uh, you know, one of the, the the many things that you you discussed this week on uh, on, on LinkedIn was uh, one of those uh, articles on uh, on Monte Carlo, and um, I was wondering if you, if Cheryl, if you had any any thoughts or input about the use of Monte Carlo uh, in, in general for, uh, for for financial retirement planning. Well, I want to preface the conversation with the fact that I'm not an expert on Monte Carlo. You know, I, I'm an annuity expert and, um, well, life insurance too, but regardless, Monte Carlo is not like something I have a huge understanding of. But my understanding of it is that it's a tool that can be used to show probability of certain events happening or probability of certain things not happening. So... To me, when I read that article, I think the article title was something to the effect of why Monte Carlo is not effective when it comes to annuities. And my first thought was, well, why would you even need that? Because every annuity 
gives you the opportunity to create a lifetime income stream, every annuity. So the probability of running out of money in retirement should be almost nothing if you buy an annuity. So to me, it didn't seem like um, it would be a logical choice to use that tool when it comes to annuities, but I'm really interested in your perspective, Bruno. Uh, well, I, I think to, to your point and what, what you mentioned, it, it is a tool. And uh, a lot of, uh, I, I find it very, um, very amusing. Well, not amusing, but very, very odd that uh, people have very strong sentiments about it. It's either... Uh, you know, the gold standard or it's either uh, not good at all. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's a tool. Uh, it should be used. And uh, if, if, if annuities are thrown in the mix and I, I think it's, it's a way to, to see annuities in, in a different, uh, different light, uh, different shed of light that the, as, as you mentioned, uh, if you do have some, some lifetime income, then well, yeah, that scenario, if you live extremely long and um you know, equities go down at the very at the onset of your retirement. And then how does that look? Uh well with or without an annuity. So mm -hmm. I think it's a tool. I think it's a great tool that should be that should be used and that that should should reveal uh should should answer some some questions. Uh at, at the same time is that uh, the the only thing that should be looked at no no I think that uh yeah, that's some some other scenarios and, and some um uh other ways to look at things is also very very important. Mm -hmm. Especially in the light of of longevity, of course, because that's the that's the biggest one out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the, the the probability that it's it's all going to be more than you're planning to have. Like the idea of guaranteed income, yes, but how big of an annuity do you need to purchase <laughs> mm -hmm. so that it's enough to cover the things you need? And I think that's the piece of like the probability or the unknown or the or what we need to play out is mm -hmm. understanding truly what those expenses look like, what those goals are the 20, 30, 40 years down the road. But I actually had a question sort of related to that and and also related to some of those statistics that Paul was talking about in their survey that's coming out, the 8 to 9 to 9% ownership. I, I recently read an article. Sorry, I can't attribute it because I don't remember the author, but I know it wasn't one of yours. Um, <laughs> but it was talking about um, how everyone plans to accumulate, but nobody plans around the distribution. Um, mm -hmm. So you, when you were talking about 401k and the opportunity for annuities to be in those plans now, um, I just wanted to maybe bring up and get your thoughts and insights on that notion that we're, uh, from a buyer's perspective, consumer's perspective, really focused on the accumulation side, but part of the challenge and where people aren't quite ready to understand what to do is not because they don't have a distribution plan. They have the accumulation plan, but then they don't actually know what to do with that 401k net when it comes time to maybe turn it in, you know, into a, a mm -hmm. new purchase and unlock or turn on that that income. So can you speak a little bit about that and just maybe conversation or other things you've read on planning for distribution versus only planning for accumulation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question, Tisa. Um you know, I think that that's part of the reason why a lot of folks in the industry are suggesting that an annuity should be a default plan in the 401k. Right. Yeah. Just because there's not a lot of likelihood that a consumer who owns a 401k is going to be familiar with an annuity, much less know what it does. So I think that's you know, a good motivator for these people suggesting this. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. But um, definitely there is an interest in that. Now, what is really interesting is when I look at, say, indexed annuities, they have over 50% of consumers electing a guaranteed lifetime withdrawal benefit on the contract. And that's just an alternative to annuitization, which has more flexibility. And there are 20% um, of consumers who have elected a GLWB on their contract are actively taking income from the contract. So I thought that was really interesting because historically, we've seen stats that say that 2% of consumers annuitize their annuities or turn it into that lifetime payment stream. And here, you know, GLWBs have existed since 2006. 
And we've already got 20% of the folks who elect to use that GLWB actively taking income. So mm -hmm. I think that we are getting more people to the decumulation phase, but there's still a lot of education that we need to do. Yeah, it's interesting. We we had a reason at the this last company to look at that, Cheryl. I, I was kind of stunned too. Now, you know, um, NASA sort of has a, a niche in the early income. So if you sold it for an early income, you presume they're going to be using it. And guess what? They actually are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, these checks mm -hmm. are, <laughs> a lot mm -hmm. of these these checks were utilized, which I think it says that, I think it's a good thing for an industry because we sold the product for this. And then guess what? They're actually using the product for this. Um, if we, they'll focus on the other, you know, areas that I, you know, that are of growth and fixed index annuities, you know, the growth annuities, the bonus annuities, um, you know, it's interesting, the allocation um, and decision sort of moves. So, you know, one, one question is, what do I, how do I allocate money in my 401k into what? Mm -hmm. Now we've got annuities. Now I'm, now I'm going to buy an annuity. Well, how much of my portfolio should I put in my annuity? Mm -hmm. I buy the annuity. How should I think about the allocation among, you know, how many choices? Um how do you, how do you what what kind of trends do you see, Cheryl, in, or in terms of uh, guiding advisors to counsel clients appropriately and how to allocate money, you know, among twenty index options? Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you asked that, Paul, because um, I've recently seen a huge uptick in the number of indexing methods that are offered on a single product. Traditionally, that number has been six different indexing methods, and now it's getting to the point where I am seeing 20 to 30 indexing methods on a single product. Um, I'll say as a product developer, that kind of blows my mind because I'm just like, this is a fixed insurance product, guys. Um, and what a lot of people don't understand is that most of these indexing methods are going to return about the same amount over a long period of time. So you know, there should be indifference to the indexing method. But what I advise agents to do is to allocate a little bit of money to the fixed bucket, especially if you've got a writer or something with a charge on the contract, and then to spread the money equally amongst all other indexing methods, because we don't know how the S&P 500 is going to perform. I mean, if you would have told me in 2008 that the S&P would be at 5,800, I would have called you crazy, but here we are. Yeah, we we, we spent a lot of time. I don't, I'm not sure if I sh shared this one with you or not, trying to give a little better guidance because you know, you, know, you shift to a topic dear, near dear to your heart, illustrations. Mm -hmm. you know, the illustration rules sometimes don't really give you you know, a good perspective on how these things actually could or would be behave because as you're, yeah. you're right, they're all engineered. So they're, they're all going to kind of on average generate, you know, the, the same re return, but, but then you think back to the, you know, famous, you know, quote of who says you, you can dra drown an average of six inches of water. Right. <laughs> so, so, you know, some of these indices, you know, when you look at them, particularly some of these, these vol, you know, controlled indices, if you do a Monte Carlo or you do a a a, a, uh, um, a a simulation of all possible outcomes based on the backcasting, suddenly, yeah, the averages may be in the middle, but some of these will have an extremely extreme divergence in tails mm -hmm. both sides. So mm -hmm. you may think you're going to get three percent, but you know what? You really, for a number of years, were getting less than one. Well, by the way, you may really head it out of the park. Um, but this this suddenly now if, if we're you know Bruno if we're going to show an agent you know twenty different distribution curves I I don't know is it too much you know is that too much information to make a decision Yeah you have you have to you have to boil it down and say like uh, to to realistic main scenarios and if you can go gr more granular after that that that's not a problem but yes overwhelming. Uh, too much information at the onset is can be very uh, very overwhelming. So yes. yeah, sure. How, how, do how do you feel about the state of illustrations today with with some of these growth oriented products? Well, you know, I remember when I was helping NAIC to develop guidelines for annuity illustrations. Um, I personally dug my heels in when they said ten best, ten worst, and the most recent ten, just because. I knew we'd have a situation like we have now where the past 10 years have been primarily bull market. And that does not help 
a consumer to have an accurate depiction of how their annuity might perform if it's a bear market. So a sequence of returns risk is a huge thing, especially when you're talking about products that could guarantee 0% interest or um, have a negative adjustment. So um, I just, I, I don't like the state of illustrations in the annuity market right now. I really wish the regulators would have decided to do something a little bit different, but I'll tell you what, Paul, it's probably here to stay for a long time. I don't see NAIC opening up annuity illustrations anytime soon. Index life illustrations are probably in the headlines much, much more, and they're not even looking to rewrite index life illustration regs. So I'm not optimistic about the annuity state being uh, addressed anytime soon. Yeah, we're looking at our system right now and request number one, maybe the six pages of disclosure could not be first. So that's, <laughs> that, that's that been our, one of our, it's like, yeah, forget the, forget the calcs and the scenarios we're trying to play out. Like it's just information overload. It immediately, you know, is, is a, is a, uh, puts up that, that barrier for the consumer. Like this is too hard. I can't understand it. So to your earlier point on uh, complexity. It just presents it. It presents complex, even if there's an agent who can explain it very well. And Tisa, what's your feel for how many pages are in an illustration for NASA? Oh, I probably shouldn't share that. People are going to say that. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> way too number. No, I no, I'm just saying that. I I think I know that. I mean, I know the number. I'm just saying they're going to say, "Well, that sounds long. We're not doing that." Um, mm -hmm. I think on average, right? We're probably twelve. 12 uh, pages? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, don't longer? Know. I would say I it's 20. 20. Yeah. I, I think it's it's about 20. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. When we're going to these complex things, um, it's interesting. I, you know, I, I don't know. I'm on the other end where we're looking at illustration systems saying, okay, where the, what's the future of the illustration systems and mm -hmm. comparisons? I, I do think, I, listen, I think, Cheryl, I think generative AI is going to be an interesting, um, uh, interesting to see how it yeah. kind of, winds its way into uh, the illustration systems. So um, mm -hmm. make it easier for agents to explain. Probably not not something you're gonna file with the, with the regulators, but for uh, helping with those conversations. I don't know, that, yeah. that's positive. I think if we could help people explain these better, it would be good. Yeah, having more well, of a digital interface for the conversation first, yeah. Yeah, you know, I have seen, um, there's a couple of insurance companies that have a tool that they use for their agents to be able to tell which index that they offer has performed the best over a like 30 year period. And they color code it. They call it the periodic chart of indices. Oh, that's great. I've seen that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's useful if you have um, different indexes that are old enough to have a history. But, you know, there's a lot of technology today. And I would say, some of them are software packages that my annuity specs competes against, um, and they're projecting returns. And agents love that because it gives them a, another illustration, so to speak, which basically says, you know, this product has the potential to beat the markets. I'm not a fan of that. I'll never um, change my software to offer something like that where you're projecting returns just because of what I spoke about with the current illustrations. I mean, we're showing bear bull market here and that's not a realistic expectation for gains for a long term on indexed annuities. Right. And there's well, yeah, other I, innovation I, I, with, with the, the index standard has come up with some of the, the innovation and, and some, some of the other unbiased services, the comparisons that, um, you know, consumers and, and, uh, and agents can use. So I think there's, there's a, uh, there, there's good, good things coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we, like even when we were, uh, you know, um, testing some of the more complex explanations that were cause we actually got from, for marketers was, well, you know, Cheryl, could you give me just like, take your 20 and give me like four presets mm -hmm. for allocations. Um, and, and I think, uh, I think once I think I've simplified a lot, I think, I think lo the mm -hmm. lot apartments have to sort of get their hands heads wrapped around that because none of the carriers want to get into the quote unquote advice uh, giving market. But I, th mm -hmm. I think, I think we're going to need that. Yeah, I definitely agree, Paul. Um, I have seen a couple of indexed annuities that have recently been introduced where there is a preset allocation on it. 
So you can't say, I want to put this much in the fixed account and this much in the S&P 500. You have maybe three choices on what percentage is going mm -hmm. to fixed or indexed, a hybrid index or domestic index, whatever. Yeah. Well, hey, Cheryl, this has been great. Appreciate your time. Yeah. Um, yeah, this this is as usual. Uh, <laughs> we we just get some great information from you. I, I don't know, Atisa, do you have any last questions or, or, or thoughts for for Cheryl? Um, let's see. I'm gonna. It's not quite the end of the year, but you know, why not start talking about 2025? So, what uh, what are your, I'll say, predictions for uh, next year? What do you see happening in the industry or in the product space that um, you're anticipating? Well, um, despite the fact that it's not a low interest rate environment, I do think we are going to con continue to see more and more indexing methods being introduced in the index mm -hmm. annuity market. I think we're going to see some more of what some people are calling MyGIA products, mm -hmm. which is like a hybrid between a MIGA mm -hmm. and an indexed annuity. Um, and honestly, the biggest thing I'm excited about is I think we're going to hit record sales. Um, just because that gets more people familiar with the products, more people are asking about it, more advisors get curious about it. I mean, there, there's FOMO going on. So um, I think the fear of missing out is something that we're getting more advisors to consider these annuities, especially fiduciaries who traditionally wouldn't have given an annuity the time of day. Yeah, that's great. And I agree. Yeah, the market is growing. A lot of opportunity. Bruno. No, thanks. Uh, we always, uh, we always welcome the, uh, the Intel rockstar input. Uh, so, uh, thanks for, thanks for coming, Cheryl. Thanks, Bruno. I appreciate it. It's been great. I always love speaking with you guys. Yeah. Well, I, Cheryl, I have my prediction for 2025 and that's, you're going to sell a lot of books. <laughs> okay. I like that prediction, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're, we will put a link to your, to your site uh, where you can, where people can buy them. I, I think it's really good. They're, I, I listen, I, I think it's useful for a lot of people. I'd, I'd rather, rather than get the NAIC, you know, consumer guide, I'd much rather have your book. <laughs> with well, I have book. a book on fixed annuities too, Paul. So, yes. you know, yeah. Maybe the next one will be on Ryla's. We'll see. That, that's okay. funny because I was going to ask you what's the next title coming in 2025, but I took it back to the industry. So yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll be waiting with bated breath. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so listen, anyway, thank you all. Uh, thanks to our listeners and be sure to join us next week for another great episode of that annuity show. Thanks. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information or listen to more episodes at thatannuityshow.com. NASA Financial Group is always working harder to be your carrier of choice. We build products that help protect people's savings and are dedicated to providing you with best in-class service. We seek to keep things simple and have your back in the years to come. NASA is headquartered in Hartford, Connecticut. Learn more at nfg.com. Zinnia, an Eldridge Industries business, simplifies insurance. It delivers comprehensive solutions for the industry's most critical needs and creates the modern rails of the insurance industry. To learn more about Zinnia, please visit zinnia.com.